Hey, it's Chuck. Today, my best show ever. Let's get it. And I don't think he's going to throw the ball as much as he thinks he's going to throw the ball now that Chip Kelly's on board. And I'm happy about that. More quarterback. Um, the truth is, Ryan Day has made a change philosophically. But it's none of those. You all know who wins. LSU is the drunkest fan base in the country. To start, that means we've got... And welcome in. I don't know if it's actually my best show ever, but I can tell you this. I've been working on something for a couple of days in anticipation of a slow news day, which I thought I was going to have, but ended up not being so. Like We got a lot that's happened in the last couple of days, um, and usually it's really slow this time of year, but the transfer portal has changed things, and we've had some other stuff come out too. Um, but what I was working on in anticipation of a slow news day is kind of something that I think is pretty cool. And it just all kind of started on a, of course, a Twitter fight that I was having um, about where Ohio State ranks in the history of college football versus other teams, other blue bloods. And um, I feel like we have got, because we've been in some high profile games recently uh, and not maybe perform the best or the way we would want to, um, and because Ryan Day is kind of such a lightning rod of a coach for whatever reason that we get this reputation that uh, we're not who we really are amongst people who don't really know the history of college football. So I came up with what I think is a pretty easy, agreeable system to kind of rank teams, um, how, how they really stack up in the history of college football. And I was working on it, compiled all the data and was going to go over it. And then all this other news came popping up. So we're going to go over that first. And at the end, we're going to get to that ranking system and I think that some of you are really going to like that. But the Heisman Trust has come out and decided that they are going to give Reggie Bush his Heisman Trophy back. They decided to not give him the, or to take away the Heisman Trophy when the NCAA decided to uh, ding him and his family for the house that his parents were staying in or, or something or other. I don't really care about the violation. But the Heisman Trophy Trust is a pretentious organization. They can run it however they want. They didn't have to do what they did. They're obviously not affiliated with the NCAA in any way. Um, I did notice that Johnny Manziel got himself involved in this to kind of platform himself, which he's been trying to do a lot recently, ever since that documentary came out uh, about him on ESPN. He's been uh, courtside at a lot of games and just trying to get his name out there again. I really can't stand this guy, but... He's now kind of taken the credit for it, um, for this Reggie Bush thing. And who knows, maybe he put some more attention on it to kind of help spur it on, but uh, we'll see. Um, but Reggie's going to get his Heisman Trophy back. And I, I, coincidentally, I just saw the Heisman Trophy last week, a really big trophy. And here's the Heisman, life-size and in-person. It looks big. It looks heavy. I don't think it's coming up on the video as big as it looks in person. You got the Outland Trophy. But anyway, there's a whole lot of Buckeyes that are coming out now saying uh, we should we should be uh, able to get the 2010 season. have Well, it should have happened again because, as we know, it didn't happen now, according to the NCAA. And, you know, that's funny stuff to laugh at. I don't know if anybody's serious about this. Um, in my opinion, obviously, as we know, the Heisman Trust and the NCAA are vastly different things. And to me, if a rule is on the books and you break the rule and then the rule becomes not the rule 14 years later, you still broke the rule when you broke it. So you kind of get what you get. Um, th that's just my opinion on it. But again, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of people disagree with me on that. It's only been three years now. Uh, the NCAA started in 1906. And for the last three years, it's been legal to receive benefits or trade on your name, image, and likeness. And if you were doing that in 2010, well, you were breaking the rules. And if you wipe that off the books, whatever happened with the Buckeyes back then, or the 99 Final Four, which Evan Turner has uh, came out and said he wants reinstated, uh, if you take away those penalties, then you kind of got to wipe away every penalty that had to do with any of that stuff from the last three years to the beginning of the NCAA, right? What would make the Buckeyes ones any different? I don't know. I guess I'm just not someone who uh, 
who has a lot of sympathy for people who knowingly break the rules that all the member institutions agreed upon. And that includes Reggie Bush, to be quite honest, and USC. Because let's not forget, USC committed these violations to boost their recruiting. And uh, a lot of people say, oh, everybody was doing it. They just did it better or bid higher. Look, I don't care. They were the ones that got popped for it. And you get what you get. That's just how I feel about things like that. But I'm sure that's probably not a popular opinion. <laughs> um, whatever you think about Tatgate, you know, there were clear violations and the players knew about them and they continually violated those rules. And uh, I don't think changing that season would do anything but irritate us more because, as we know, if that season were reinstated, then we would still think about that horrible bull ban and that horrible decision that Gene Smith made by not self-imposing a bull ban. And then the 12 and 0 season, when that bull ban was assessed, uh, we would have been in the BCS national championship game against Notre Dame, most likely would have beat Notre Dame. And we've got a whole lot of, we most likely would have beat such and such in a national championship game. Uh, I feel like we have more of those than anybody else. Of course, the most recent one, the field goal against Georgia, which honestly, I don't really like to say, you know, we were a field goal away. I think we were more like 10 yards away because that field goal from that range never had a chance. So anyway, we, we, we definitely would have beat TCU. I was at that BCS national championship game in Miami, Alabama, Notre Dame. Um, it wouldn't have been Alabama we were facing, though. It would have been Notre Dame. And that team was pathetic. It, we would have absolutely stomped them. There's no doubt about it. It looked like their starters, their starters look, you know, they were quality starters. The, the two deep was, it looked like a high school team. It really did. Brian Kelly just did not have the recruiting up at that point. And um, yeah, they had no chance against Ohio State either. That was a sure national championship. But again, we don't know if the NCAA would have accepted Gene's uh, self-imposed bull ban as enough. You know, it, it just uh, sometimes when you self-impose it, they accept it. Sometimes they don't. So we can't say for sure, but we're not going to rag on Gene. Gene's out of here. The Houston Texans. So the Houston Texans, a lot of Buckeyes' second favorite team all of a sudden based on CJ. Um, you know, I can get down with that. My son is uh, maybe like a seven-year-long Houston Texans fan, and I've bought him a whole lot of gear over the years because he's kind of like me with, uh, with football gear. Go figure. But the Houston Texans have been teasing that they were getting new uniforms for a while, and they have rolled out the new uniforms. My son's been counting these things down, and we were both really disappointed because they had hinted at coming out with a Houston Oilers kind of style uniform which we both absolutely love, and we're looking forward to that. But we did not get that. They uh, came out with one that has kind of an accent with that blue, but but not, uh, not what we were hoping for. However, they did change their standard blue and their standard red, which we can just call scarlet now, because here is the Texans brass explaining their new uniform colors it's dark yeah, it's it, deep it, steel blue it, we've gone back to deep steel yeah. blue yeah it looked it didn't look the the same it looks like pretty significantly different too the just it looks the same yet kind of different a little bit darker so nike didn't make the deep steel blue color that we used to have mm -hmm. and so it went to a lighter navy um this color actually is the same as the yankees navy okay it's that deep dark deep, steel blue. dark blue yep. which is where we started yeah, which is back in the day. Right. Uh, back in the day. All right, so let's get to some questions that we've been talking about here that you guys can Hold answer. on. Speaking of colors. Yeah. So we went to a brighter red. Yes. Th very much a brighter red. And which we're showing this, it. This red is a red from, where is it, babe? Ohio Florida? State. Ohio State. And so oh, when we okay. started okay. this, the Ohio was State. before mm -hmm. okay. we got oh, CJ. Oh, really? So That's right. Yeah. That's right. Before CJ, then CJ comes in, he goes, that's my color. That's yeah, it was pretty, pretty. You know, I have a prediction. I think that CJ is probably he's going to be at least a top three highest selling jersey. With the I think that is awesome. Um, not only that, uh, I think that there's a whole lot of people that view the Buckeyes like the Yankees, and the, the fact that they put those two together, you know, they're two teams that 
you either love or you hate either way you watch and the ratings prove that out but the fact that cj is now going to be wearing a uh, buckeye scarlet on a, a actual buckeye scarlet in the nfl i think it's awesome and uh, that guy thinking that it's going to be a top three selling jersey might be underestimating it. I think that C.J. Stroud has a shot at being the number one selling jersey uh, in the NFL, especially that H-Town blue jersey. I think a lot of people are going to love this one. Um, definitely not an Oilers jersey, which I do believe would have hit number one, something similar to it. But unfortunately, this is what we get. And uh, my kid already ordered one for uh, everybody in the family. So I'm going to have one, too. Mine is going to be the Scarlet one, of course. Coincidentally, they are sold out, by the way, now. I went and checked again, and they're, go they're gone. Totally out. And I'm sure they stocked up really high, but they're already gone. Marvin Harrison. So the NFL draft tonight, um, I don't know where Marvin Harrison's going to go. I'm not going to try to predict it, though I have heard that he uh, – some some guys have uh, neighbors as the number one wide receiver on the board, some NFL GMs. That came from Bruce Feldman, who is one of the most respected guys in the biz. Um, that would be insane, I think, if anybody did that. Uh, they'd be really risking their job, to be honest, because Marvin Harrison Jr. is, to me, the most sure thing I've ever seen uh, at wide receiver. Th there is just absolutely no way Marvin Harrison is a miss based on his work ethic, based on his drive, based on his skills, based on how polished he already is, he's a sure thing. He's as sure a thing as you can ever have. So, hey, do it at your own risk, but uh, I would advise against it. But our guy Marv has signed a deal with New Balance, and lawn mowing dads with knee-high socks uh, everywhere are rejoicing. Now, New Balance has done such a turn <laughs> New Balance was like the dorky dad shoe for so long, and now Marvin Harrison is repping them. And my kids think that New Balance are cool, which is the weirdest thing. It kind of happened with Champion, too. I don't know if you guys are hip to this, but Champion, you know, the C Champion, like that used to be kind of a, I don't know, when I was a kid, it was kind of like the generic sportswear. You didn't really want it, but I had a lot of it. Um, that's now somehow cool. Champion is not only cool, but it's kind of expensive too, which just blew my mind when I found this out from my boys. But uh, New Balance, also now a cool brand. And it's it's one of my favorite shoes. I have like 12 pairs of 574s. You can customize them. And I really like them. I, I'm kind of a sneakerhead. I know a lot of sneakerheads are into the Jordans. I'm not because I hate Michael Jordan because he ruined my childhood uh, as a Cavs fan, along with John Elway as a Browns fan. And uh, can't get behind Michael Jordan or his shoes. Another reason to hate Michigan, who wears Jordan and has the jump man on their football uniform, which I think is the silliest, stupidest looking thing ever. But uh, New Balance, that's my slam. And I'm happy that Marv is repping New Balance. And I really think that New Balance is right up his alley, man. That is right his speed. Uh, Devin Brown. Devin Brown put an Instagram story on Tuesday. Devin Brown doesn't put many social media posts up. So when this particular post went up, there was a whole lot of Buckeye fans that were reading into it. Here's the picture that he put up. And you can see Ryan Day looking at him in the background. Now, what I can't play for you, because I'll get dinged with a copyright, is the song that's playing. And the lyrics to the song keep repeating over and over again. And those lyrics are, they claim that they're real, but I can see it in their eyes. Claim that they're real, but I can see it in their eyes. Over and over again. Now, there's a whole lot of people who are reading into that. Um, take of that what you will. Devin Brown has put out some cryptic tweets in the past, some cryptic Instagram posts in the past. Uh, I don't know what to think of it. I'm not going to read into it much, but, you know, it's something. It might be. Who knows? But let's talk about DB. Let's talk about the quarterbacks. About a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks, I was totally convinced that one, at least one of these guys in the quarterback room, were going to head out because it just seems absolutely crazy that you could have five super talented quarterbacks that could all start somewhere. Even, even the fresh, like Aaron Nolan could start somewhere 
in the FBS right now as a freshman, a, you know, a very raw freshman. There's no doubt in my mind. And to have five of those type guys on one roster just seems unfathomable. And uh, I don't know, man. I came out maybe two weeks ago on the show and said I was thinking about it a little more in depth and kind of putting myself in each one of their shoes. And maybe there's a way that all five of them can stay. And I just went through, all right, what could this guy be thinking that might lead him to stay? Well, Aaron Nolan doesn't really have a reason to leave yet unless he was angry because he's he's definitely not going to start anywhere right now that he would want to go to. Uh, so he's getting developed and getting some good coaching. Why leave now? Lincoln, you know, the Iowa stuff we knew was garbage. And he's only been here not even a year yet. He wasn't here for last spring. So to think that he was going to start might be silly. And why leave now? He's still got some good coaching he's getting. And even if he wanted to leave, he doesn't have to do it now. Julian, obviously, nobody thought he was leaving. Uh, a very bright future at Ohio State. And then it's just down to Devin or Will. Well, I don't know. Is Devin going to leave? I don't think he is. And I think the smart money is on. Now, these five guys are really sticking here. That's crazy. And Devin, I mean, when I think about this in 2025, so let's say they go through this season, Devin sticks around, Will Howard starts, and Devin's coming back in 25 with two years of eligibility left. And now he's going up against Julian Sayan for the starting job in his third straight year, a two-man starting job with Devin Brown and somebody else. That almost makes me feel awkward right now just thinking about it because I don't think he can win against Julian Sayan. And I think that Ryan Day is very enamored with Julian Sayan. Um, that's just my initial thought about it. And yeah, I'm talking way down the line. Uh, man, it makes me feel awkward because if this poor dude lost again for the third year in a row, I'd hate to even think about it. But I do think now that, man, there's a really good chance that uh, they're coming back with five dudes in this quarterback room. And I don't think anybody thought that. That's just wild. And if we remember, back when McCord first transferred, most of the people close to the program were saying, if you brought in a transfer quarterback, and at the time you had Devin, you had Lincoln, and you had Air coming in, if you bring in a transfer quarterback, you're probably going to lose at least one or two of those guys, maybe the whole quarterback room. We heard it time and time again. And I think that uh, it's time we recalibrate how we think about bringing in transfers because it's new to all of us, right? It's only been going on a couple of years. And we've seen certain schools that happen, but it appears that if you have a very stable environment, um, in a well-coached place that people want to be at, maybe that's not quite the case. Um, I think we're seeing that at Ohio State, and you know we we will probably see that at Georgia too. Uh, I would imagine if a guy like Rashad goes ends up going there in their quarterback room, there's been some speculation of who's going to move out if he comes in. Now that we're seeing this kind of shake out at Ohio State, I imagine we might see a kind of a similar thing down there, and then maybe we'll recalibrate how we feel about transfers coming in when we're talking about a very stable place like a Georgia or, or, or an Ohio state. Um, just a thought I was having about it, but I, I did have this discussion with, uh, with a, a gentleman in the comments the other day, he was taught, we were talking about Graham Nicholson, the kicker. And his thought was, if you bring in Graham Nicholson, it's going to disturb the kicker room and maybe fielding leaves. Now I think a guy like fielding, who just finished his freshman year would have absolutely stayed and learned behind the Lou Groza winner that would have made him better, no doubt. But now that tampering is essentially legal, as we know, Alabama definitely tampered with him to get him to leave Miami, Ohio. I don't know if you're not better off using that strategy when it comes to specialists like kickers who really, I mean, let's be honest. They're, they're part of the team, no doubt, but I, I don't know about kicker room chemistry or anything like that, but as far as team chem, I mean, these guys, they're on the opposite side of the field during practice. They warm up by themselves. You never see them. 
uh, at practice. I mean, they're just, they're off doing their own thing the whole time. And um, I don't know how much chemistry you lose by going after, let's say a junior kicker every couple of years in the portal or pulling him out of a big 12 school, somebody with experience. It might be the only position I would think that maybe going the portal route might be better off than trying to bring in a kicker and develop them. I don't know, just a thought I was having, but if there was a position where you would think that uh, that might work out, kicker just might be it. And, you know, I don't know, freshman kickers, it's not something uh, I really ever want to have starting again. We'll put it that way. Jim Tressel, uh, personal role model of mine, the guy that's, uh, you know, right behind my shoulder here. And that's one of many pictures I have of him around the, around the, the basement or the studio, if you will. There has uh, been some Buckeye backlash, probably a pretty small group of fans, I'd imagine, because we all love JT. But JT was uh, on the sideline at the Notre Dame spring game, supporting Marcus Freeman, decked out in Irish regalia. And he's obviously there to support Marcus. I I might, I might have a problem with Marcus Freeman for the things he said about Ohio State, but I definitely don't have a problem with the classiest guy I know going there to support his guy. And it probably, it's probably not his stuff. He probably walked in there like a, any recruit. They were like, let us cure you up. And he's like, sure. Okay. Um, so whatever, man, I got no problem with him doing that. He's more of a Buckeye than I'll ever be. And I can't get mad at him for anything. Uh, I can't believe anybody would, to be honest. But if you say Marcus, Marcus Freeman was coaching at Michigan, uh, I might feel a little bit differently. I'd probably feel a lot differently. But I don't think he would do that if he was at Michigan. I really don't. Um, Roddy Gale. Roddy Gale, Buckeye basketball player that entered the transfer portal, decided to go to Michigan. Um, obviously, a blow. I, I hate hearing it. And I just, uh, I did a, I did a little, uh, it's a short on YouTube where I, I said, you know, I bl I blame Tony Alford for this and, you know, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but kind of serious too, because I really do feel that when you have a coach of 10 years at Ohio state or Michigan and they up and do this, that it just kind of sets the tone like, Oh, all right, well, I guess this isn't that big of a deal. And it should be, man. It should be because there is only one thing that both Ohio State and Michigan fans agree on and take pride in. There's only one, and it is this is the best rivalry in all of sports. It's something that is not just great to be a part of and also awful to be a part of at times, but it's something that uh, that, that is beneficial to both programs. And if this starts becoming the norm, with the transfer portal now, guys crossing the line like this, I'm not going to like it, and uh, I feel like it, it it takes away a little bit from it, um, makes it maybe a little less serious than uh, than I think it is, than maybe you think it is. And this is a basketball player from uh, New York. You know, when you get a guy like Tony Alford, who's from Ohio, from my hometown, and uh, he does something like this, you know, I, I just think that it, uh, it, it slightly diminishes it in the eyes of those out of state guys that are at both Michigan and Ohio state. And I definitely hope this does not become the norm or something that we see often, but seeing Roddy Gale do this so quickly off the heels of Tony Alford doing this, it makes me kind of scared. There is a, uh, an NIL agency, right? And there's now a couple of these NIL agencies that kind of represent these students in the transfer portal. Well, there's a big one now, and they have named themselves Portal Kings. And I don't have a story about these guys, but I saw that the other day, and I feel that naming yourself Portal Kings is absolutely hilarious. But I do have a story about the portal, and that is Dylan Edwards. So after Travis Hunter, Dylan Edwards was probably the most dynamic player on that Colorado team last year. He had been committed to Notre Dame, and he flipped to uh, Deion Sanders in Colorado. Um, a real scat back, and like a true scat back, 
Not like people are calling Sam Williams Dixon, who's not a real scat back. This dude's like 5'8", 175, receiver out of the backfield, dynamic player. And he decided to transfer out of Colorado the day after Dallin Hayden decided to come in. And it makes absolutely no sense to me because those two don't have the same skill set. And I felt like we're going to complement each other really good. But uh, I think it's, a, you know, it's obviously good for Dallin as he's going to be featured more. And uh, I don't know what this kid's doing here, uh, Edwards, but we're seeing a common theme amongst the guys that Dion attracts, I think as now that's he became the 36th player heading out of Colorado 36 um it's kind of a me first kind of guy that's who he attracts and when they don't get it when things don't go exactly the way they want they're heading back out the door and you know the fact that this is the program Hayden just joined is what bothered me about the entire thing so i wish him the best i hope he gets the ball a ton but, uh, you know, the fact that I got a root for Dallin Hayden playing for this guy and, and that team is just, it's horrible. But I will, because he's my dude. This week, the Buckeye coaches are traveling. It is a recruiting week. We talked about Chip Kelly heading on the road, heading out to uh, California to see Brady Schmeigel and Ryan, Ryan Hewn, and then heading down to uh, Florida after that to see our guy, Dia Bell. But, uh, Larry Johnson and Jim Knowles are traveling this week to Indiana, and they went to see Marion Dye. And Marion Dye is the 177th ranked player, 6'5", 255. Uh, he's the 16th ranked, ranked edge. I don't think he'll be an edge long. He's more like a Jason Moore type of guy, three tech, really big dude. Um, plays against really weak competition, which we're going to see now as I'm going to pull up some of his highlights here. I mean, you can just see that how big he is. This is, I don't know what division this is in Indiana, but uh, Indiana produces some high level talent from time to time. And the rest of the, the rest of the crew is not very high level, but look, I mean, it's he's totally unblocked in every place. So it's really hard to get a true evaluation here, but you can tell he's an explosive dude and a really big kid. He's essentially just running free every play. This one's pretty impressive. So he's way off the ball here. From the 50-yard line on the opposite side of the field, and he's going to take a perfect angle and catch this running back at the 10. That's pretty impressive. That's some serious hustle. Love to see that. So there he is, and uh, they also went to see Damian Shanklin, also a kid out of Indiana. Um, he's going to be coming for a visit soon. He is a top 100 player, number 10 overall edge. And he's 6'4", 230, Shanklin is, and a more prototypical edge rusher. Um, he's got a really fast first step, but again, kind of weak competition for him as well. And we'll 75, what are you doing here? Take a look at 75 here. Look at this first step on the left, the left tackle here. Look at this first step, this little tiny step here. Not a chance to get in front of him. But look at our buddy on the right. Look at the right tackle, 73. Watch this first step. Watch his right leg. Boom, way out there. Gets out in front of his man. Um, so we got Justin Fry, coach kid on the left, and uh, somebody else is coaching the kid on the right. Shanklin is long. He's fast. Very athletic. Oh, 54 is pulling, and he, he ran into the wrong dude there. This kid's tough. This competition looks to be a little better. I'm wondering if this isn't a division up. Good use of the hands there. So Shanklin is uh, – both these dudes are really good. Shanklin is much more of a traditional edge, and I think that uh, adding him to this class would be fantastic. 
this class is looking really good on the defensive line now, and they do need a whole heck of a lot of defensive linemen. Uh, Coach Carlos Lachlan is also heading out on the road, too, as he's heading up to Villa Angeles St. Joe's to see Bo Jackson. Now, Bo is – he was a real, I thought, pretty heavily an Ohio State lean. But Georgia and Alabama have been making a really, really hard push on him. He's a top five back in the country, and he's definitely uh, he's definitely worth them getting it all in on him. But, you know, it looks like Marquise Davis out of Cleveland Heights, uh, Alan Tro and Tom Loy from 24-7 have both come out and given a crystal ball to Marquise for Michigan. He's still big on, on uh, Kentucky and Tennessee, but all signs are pointing to Michigan. Some Buckeye fans have pointed out that they don't want a Buckeye who's considering Michigan seriously. I got some bad news for them. Um, before we adopted a national recruiting strategy, it was probably one out of four Ohio State recruits from the history of, of time have considered Michigan strongly, including tons of Buckeye legends like Spielman and Vrabel. Uh, the list could go on all day. That's a blue blood program, and as much as I hate it, it's like you know, it's a top five program in the history of college football. Uh, but Michigan usually has a good running back, so getting Marquise Davis doesn't mean a ton to me, uh, other than he's the guy that I wanted. But you know, we got Bo Jackson. Let's watch a Bo Jackson touchdown to cheer us up. It's Davy and St. Clair. I have not. Oh, good enough, Chuck. Here we go. Here's Bo. Here comes a 95 yarder. This is slick. This was against St. V at John Sestone Field. My old coach. Look at him fly. And again, abusing my Irish that day. He did. He did for sure. I mean, that, that's smooth. Bo's a highlight reel waiting to happen. He's tough. He's fast. This run I love. Now watch this dude. He's so big and so heavy. This momentum should be carrying him out of bounds at about the 25. And the way that he is able to cut back in there with that momentum coming out is really impressive. The way he turns it up right there. That that is a sick cut. That is really impressive. So, look, Bo's awesome. Bo's awesome. Jordan Davison's awesome. Watching Marquise go up there, gonna hurt. It's gonna sting. And the Michigan faithful are bragging about Marquise, saying that Ohio's best come to Michigan. Jordan Marshall, the running back they got last year, Mr. Ohio is the only top 10 player in Ohio that they have had in the last three classes. So I find it pretty weird that they keep saying that. But it is definitely true that the best players in Michigan history have been Ohioans. Desmond Howard from the aforementioned Villa Angeles St. Joe's, Bo Jackson's high school. Well, it was just St. Joe's back then. Um, obviously him and Charles Woodson, two of their three Heisman Trophy winners. Bo Schembechler from Barberton, Ohio who's their best coach, most revered coach ever. I mean, it, they revere him more than fielding Yost, we'll put it that way, with all those fake championships from the 19 aughts, right? Um, but Bo never won a national championship. And uh, to be honest, I think that bragging about the best players of your program coming from another state is pretty embarrassing. And I know that Jim Harbaugh was embarrassed by it too. His first six years as the head coach at Michigan, he only had 12 Ohio kids that he recruited. The previous six years, they had 41. He didn't want to recruit in Ohio because he was embarrassed the two states with the same exact population in the same region of the country, and one has excellent high school football and puts a ton of guys into, uh, into college, D1, and the other one doesn't. So he didn't recruit Ohio well because of that, and that's just the fact. But Michigan does have the number one player in the class of 2025 coming out of high school, a uh, quarterback from Michigan named Bryce Underwood, absolute number one overall quarterback. Of course, he committed to LSU and not Michigan, which is incredibly embarrassing as well. 
but I am sticking my flag in the ground right now and saying that this class, Tavian St. Clair is going to overtake Bryce Underwood and be the number one overall player in the class giving Ohio State back-to-back -back number one overall prospects. And I'm not the only one that thinks that. Now, this is the big dog at 24-7, talking about Tavian St. Clair. Well, Tavian St. Clair, I have not seen him in person yet, uh, but it was the video that Tom Loy, when he went out to, I believe, Las Vegas, right? They had that combine. And you see him, Underwood's out there, and all these other top quarterbacks are out there. And you see St. Clair, and it's a different type of player just in terms of how he's built, how he's put together, uh, and the way that he can stroke the football. So super excited about him. He earns his invite to the Elite 11 Finals. Drew, think about it this way. Got Jeremiah Smith last year, right? 2024, you got St. Clair. Still got some work to do, but in prime position at number six. We'll have the Elite 11 Finals. We'll also have his senior year as well. Uh, has he committed to an All-Star game yet? He is in the All-American Bowl. There we go, baby, on it early. Uh, so he'll have plenty of opportunities uh, for the race for not only quarterback number one, but more than likely number one overall. So we'll see what happens there. But Ohio State, think about it this way. Jeremiah Smith, potentially Tavian St. Clair. And then in 2026, you're looking pretty good right now with Chris Henry as well, right? So um, Ohio State putting it together at the top of the board. I mean, that was quite a dismissal of Bryce Underwood right there. And it seems to me that the momentum is moving for Tavian St. Clair to work his way up to that number one. And when we talk about Chris Henry Jr., uh, it looks like uh, he's probably going to be the number one in 26. He's already the number one in 26 overall in 24-7. And it just came out yesterday from on three that he is now their number one overall. When we talk about number ones overall, incredibly rare to get one. But to get one three years in a row is like I've been talking about for a while now, peak Alabama Nick Saban recruiting. And it's just insane. It's insane to think about. But we got it that good right now, guys. We really do. And Tavian St. Clair, his rise has just been pretty meteoric. It's something we haven't seen in a long time. His physical development has been crazy. Everybody we heard at, from the, that was at that Elite 11 could not stop talking about how impressive he was physically. 6'4", they're calling him like 215, 220 now. Well put together. An imposing dude. Here he is with his parents in 2022. That's his dad, Marcus, played tight end at Bell Fountain in the wing T offense. Far cry from Tavian's uh, Bell Fountain chieftain offense. And here's Tavian from over the weekend at that Elite 11 that everybody's talking about. A year and a half later, And let's watch a couple Tavian plays from uh, last season. And yeah, I'm telling you, I think he's going to end up number one in the class. My guy, Josh Pate, took Tuesday off from the transfer portal to interview our very own Ryan Day. Uh, Ryan Day came off great. His haters have had this narrative about him, and even a few recanted their hate for him. Or they're hating him so much based off of this interview because he did so well. The hate for him is just insane. I've never seen anything like it from a guy who's just kind of nice and competent. It's really kind of disturbing. But if you look at the comments under that Pate video, it's just wild how many people hate him. I mean, it's kind of gross. I tease Harbaugh, but he's a strange dude and easy to tease. I rag on Sharon Moore. I think Moore's a really nice guy. I think he's a quality guy. I don't think he's a bad coach. I just think it was a bad move to hire a rookie first-time coach to hire his first staff at a Blue Blood program. I think Dan Lanning's great. I think Kirby Smart's excellent. I think Lance Leopold is fantastic, incredibly impressive. Same with Kalen DeBoer. I just disagree with a lot of the stuff he does. I rag on these guys a bit. 
But the way people talk about Ryan Day is just disturbing to me. And I know we're talking about college football, and college football fans are, for the most part, just much more nasty than most sports we th- that I'm kind of involved in. And I get it, but the way they talk about him is just, it makes no sense to me. It really doesn't. And he did a great job. Ryan did a great job, and Josh Pate did a great job getting Ryan out of his shell because it started off not very promising for me. It started off very much like a Ryan Day press conference, and that kind of goes something like a question is asked, Ryan starts answering, and he's so smooth that you find yourself kind of nodding along with what he's saying because he's saying great stuff, and then you realize halfway through his answer that he's not saying anything that had to do with the question, (laughs) totally ignoring the question and just saying what he was going to say. And it started off like that, but Pate kept pressing and Day started letting his guard down and he started giving some really insightful answers and it was a whole lot of fun. Um, Day said he was the, he believes Ohio State is, he's biased, but he believes Ohio State is the best in the world at developing elite talent. And I don't think anybody can argue that uh, other than some people say, well, Ohio State brings in five stars, so of course they're going to have all these draft picks. But when we talk about developing elite level talent, we've seen a ton of five-star and very high rated four-star guys go into college and not develop the way they're developed at Ohio state. When we look at the rookies of the year, it just goes to show you that other schools that bring in the Georgias and Alabamas, all that high level talent don't develop it the same way Ohio state does. Um, it's kind of irrefutable when you look at the rookies of the years. You can also look, of course, at the pile of draft picks, uh, the first rounders, most first rounders since 2000, and uh, of course, most first rounders all time, Ohio State. Um, But he's right. He also talked about guys like JTT, Caleb, Marvin, Travion, um, guys that come in that have tons of talent that are also disciplined and skilled. That's how you get the great player. And, uh, it was just a really insightful, uh, insightful piece. Um, something that was probably really interesting that that I think kind of confirmed many of our suspicions is he talked about bringing in Quinshawn and kind of how that all went down. So he said Quinshawn, when he reached out to want to come to Ohio State, which we all suspected the way that kind of went down, and we had heard heard that here and there. But it was never really confirmed. But yeah, Quinshawn reached out, and I totally believe that's the way it went down. It just always felt that way to me. And I would love to hear Quinshawn talk about that more. But when Quinshawn reached out, he said he got a hold of Trey. And he was talking, the whole point of this was was the selflessness and the kind of guys that you need, the guys that want to be around the best competition and play with the best competition on their team. Uh, that Trey was like, all for it. Let's go. If it'll make the team better, it'll make me better. Let's get it. And then he got a hold of Quinn and he told him, hey, Travion's not going anywhere, which confirms that, you know, that was known at the time, which we didn't know that was known at the time that Travion was, in fact, coming back. Uh, Quinshawn says, great, we'll be a two headed monster. Let's get it. So it confirms that Quinshawn did want to come to Ohio State and reached out and that Trey was, you know, it, it was discussed with him before Quinshawn was brought on. And that his mind was already made up that he was coming back at that point. And that was not public information at that point. So interesting that he uh, he went that that in depth on that. Asked about something that that uh, he would not have prepared for, didn't know, didn't know he was going to get into uh, when he was taking on the position of being a head coach. Uh, And it was it was about his assistant coaches and how much how big of a role they would actually play. Uh, in the day to day, and how all those little decisions that they make with their room, with the guys, and the relationships they build with the guys would end up manifesting themselves in the matchup games. And then he said he was being very uh, much more uh, cautious and thoughtful and deliberate about hiring guys. Um, this was a sincere answer. It was very smart, it was very deliberate. Uh, he knows that all of his coaches are watching, and he knows that all the coaches around the country are paying attention to what the coach of Ohio State's saying. And the way he uh, he went on about assistant coaches, it was sharp. It's a sincere answer, but he's a very savvy dude, and he is a very well respected guy in the coaching profession. And uh, you know, talking about coaches like that is always a good thing. 
Pate discussed growing up around the Iron Bowl and and uh, admitting that, you know, hearing about Ohio State and Michigan when he was young and then being at the game, it was like something he'd never seen, the intensity alone. It's nice to hear one of those Southern guys who is ingrained in the Iron Bowl admit that about the Ohio State-Michigan game because, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk every rivalry season people rank the rivalries and to go against the grain, I think more than anything, some people in the media and college football media will say uh, they they rank the iron bowl as number one. And that's just ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. It could never be number one because Auburn's like the 15th ranked program in the history of college football. Um, that could never compare. And the fact that they're in the same state, one's like big brother, one's little brother. I mean, you could put that on par with, with, all right, maybe not so much on par, but Michigan, Michigan State is a similar kind of deal that, to Alabama Auburn, which is a good rivalry. They both are, but they're nothing like the rivalry. And Pate admits it as a guy who grew up directly, you know, in Iron Bowl country. And uh, that was nice to answer and uh, nice to hear. But Coach Day went on to uh, discuss about that game being so much about physicality uh, th that it all comes down to that. And I can just, uh, you know, I'm sure that that one will be clipped and played by our rivals quite a bit who like to call him soft. And they're going to uh, make some good memes with that one, no doubt, about that being about physicality and toughness. And uh, he also brought up the, oh, he brought up the 17 game. And JT Barrett getting hit with the camera and Dwayne coming in. So JT gets hit with the camera, busts his knee up. And, you know, it's something that... Uh, I don't know. It doesn't get brought up enough, I don't think, when we talk about the game. But imagine if we had lost that game because of that. I mean, that was so crazy. That was such a crazy moment. Heading into that game, warming up, and the starting quarterback gets busted in the knee by a camera on the sideline and can't go. Like, that's just bizarre. Um, it's kind of like something you'd see in a movie and you wouldn't believe. Crazy story. Luckily, we win the game. Uh, a lot of kudos to Dwayne, rest in peace. What a stud, um, his coming out party and, uh, just a crazy story, a crazy game. And thank goodness we won that game. Maybe my favorite story of the, the entire thing was day describing the difference in recruits, uh, when you see him at practice and he said, you can physically see it when there's a big play at practice, you can see the ones that, uh, you know, they're standing on the sidelines that can kind of, they, you know, they kind of shy away from it or the ones that almost are stepping on the field. He said, you can physically see it. And when you see it, you say, ah, that's the one. I thought that was really cool to hear. Pate also talked to him about guys with the attitude of, uh, you know, ones that, that, you know, you might want to, do you want to talk them in to come into Ohio state or, or, uh, you know, do you, do you not want to? And, and Ryan Day was talking about, you know, what we don't ever want to talk them into it, especially with, you know, now with the transfer portal. We want to open our doors, say, here's why we want you. Here's what you're going to expect here. It's going to be competition. Every room you're in, you're going to be going against the best players in the country. And at practice, you're going to be going across from the best players in the country. And uh, we want the guys that, that want that because Ohio State's not for everybody. And that kind of environment isn't for everybody. And it was just, uh, it was a really cool piece. Ryan absolutely crushed it. And it was awesome to watch. And uh, I think you should all watch it if you haven't. I would play some clips, but, you know, I think you should all watch it. So it was an awesome piece. I was, I was really uh, impressed with the way Ryan did. He really came off great. Um, some people were pointing out the room that they were in was a little embarrassing. So we talked about the facilities last week and the room that they are in is uh, their auditorium, their team meeting kind of auditorium. And when you look at that auditorium and you compare it to the auditoriums at the new places, it is, you know, pretty outdated. And uh, this is, you know, the, the talk of the town right now on the Twitter sphere. Uh, there's a big argument between Buckeye fans about uh, 
should they update the facilities or not? Which, you know, yes, I stand on the, on the yes camp. They should. And primarily because they've updated all the other facilities. Uh, I, I don't even think this should be updated. I think they should tear it down and build a new one. It's 75,000 square feet. Notre Dame is building 150,000 square foot one. And everybody else's Georgia's, Texas's, Bama's, uh, Auburn's even, uh, are, are that same size too. So when you got closets that are now office space, yes, build a new facility and Ross Bjork will, he'll get that done. Now that's it for the interview. Let's talk about, uh, about the other thing. So I, uh, like I said, I was talking to another person that didn't really know the history of college football. And it was a discussion about a player in the transfer portal. And somebody had mentioned something about, uh, they wanted him at Ohio state. Uh, no, it was about Quinn yours. It was about Quinn yours. And the person said, well, of course he wanted to go to Texas. You know, I mean, Ohio state's good, but it's not Texas or something to that effect. And it really hit on two main things for me that I've thought for a long time. And one is that Texas has an image amongst a lot of folks that, uh, that is much bigger than what they've actually been in the history of college football in Ohio state, the opposite. So there's eight historical blue bloods and the eight historical blue bloods are Ohio state, Michigan, USC, Notre Dame, Oklahoma, Texas, Alabama, Nebraska. And those eight historical blue bloods, uh, of those eight teams, I always kind of thought that Texas of those eight was kind of the lowliest. Um, when we talk about even in their, uh, in their rivalry, Oklahoma and Texas, I think most people would think that Texas was kind of the boss of that rivalry. Texas just has that reputation amongst people who don't really uh, follow closely. The truth is Oklahoma is the king. Um, Oklahoma is, is a much more prestigious program with a much richer history of winning football championships, Heisman's, uh, head to head, um, than Texas. It's not even close really. And I don't think most people feel that way. Texas has this outsized reputation based on their money. I think it might, a lot of it might be the image and the colors. They got great looking uniforms. Um, but Texas just isn't all that. So it got me really fired up because we conversely on a national scale have the opposite reputation and the opposite image. And it's primarily because we are a lightning rod of a program that people love to hate. Um, and we've had some embarrassing losses uh, on big stages. But the fact is we're on the big stage so often, right? So the fact that we've lost maybe more than we've won recently on the big stage has made us kind of this punching bag. And a lot of people don't quite understand where Ohio state fits in the landscape. And I get this a lot when I post things on different platforms that a lot of younger folks are on like TikTok, And I post my stuff, the comments make it very clear to me that people just aren't quite sure what Ohio state is in the history of college football, because they hear this kind of nonsense uh, poking Ohio state, like there's some kind of joke and it drives me nuts. So I decided on a slow news day, I would sit down and figure out how I would rank the top eight programs in the history of college football. And I did it. And I think I came up with a very fair way to rank it. And I recorded this earlier. I'm going to splice it on right now. It explains how I ranked the teams, what criteria I used and where they all fall. Um, a couple things of note. Um, number one, I was right about Texas. Number two, when we talk about those eight historical blue bloods, the reason we talk about those eight historical blue bloods as the blue bloods, and this is a, this term has been kind of bastardized. Those are the blue bloods of college football. That term means those teams. It doesn't mean anybody else. If you want to come up with a new term, new bloods or red bloods, that's fine. But the term blue blood refers to those teams and those teams only. And the reason that is you're going to find out in these results because those eight teams are still clearly above all the others when we, when we rank down everything statistically. Even Nebraska, and Nebraska's been down for 20 years. That's how far ahead those eight teams are of everybody else. And I added in Georgia in these rankings because I think it's pertinent. Um, 
and Georgia comes close. Georgia's nine, um, you know, nine and ten rounds out to be Georgia and Tennessee would be your would be your nine and ten if you were going down to ten. But the eight historical blue bloods still reign supreme in every single category, including Nebraska. And spoiler alert, I was right. Texas is the lowest, even lower than Nebraska, of all the blue bloods. And uh, when, when you compile all the rankings, um, number one might not surprise you. Maybe it will. Number three, I think might surprise you. So here we go. Here's my rankings. How do we rate the best college football programs ever? How do we judge? It's so difficult because college football is a sport with such a long history. It was so regional for a very long time. Uh, some schools started earlier than others, got good, better than others. So many different uh, voting bodies voted for things like national championships. So many schools have a crazy number of national championships that are claimed and, and some are disputed. So it's tough. So I came up with what I feel are the 11 best criteria to judge the dominance, relevance, and success of a college football program. And those 11 categories are total wins, all time, total winning percentage, all time, national championships, playoff appearances, consensus All-Americans, number of weeks in the AP poll, number of weeks at number one in the AP poll, all-time draft picks, all-time first-round draft picks, and Heisman trophies. Um, these are the categories that I've chosen that I feel are the most relevant. Now, you could have some that you think are more relevant or less relevant. You could have some that uh, you think don't belong in there and want to add one. And I've played around with the numbers that way too. And uh, it pretty much doesn't matter how you splice it. They, they usually always come back in the same order of eight. In the top eight programs, no matter how you use these numbers or what extra categories you add in, are always going to be the same eight programs, and that is the eight historical Blue Bloods. Notre Dame, Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, USC, Oklahoma, Texas, Nebraska. Those eight programs have separated themselves quite a bit from the rest of college football. That's why they're the Blue Bloods, and that's why they'll remain the Blue Bloods. And even a school like Nebraska, who's been down for 20 years, is still there. So what I did was I went through each category and I assigned a rank for each school in that category. For instance, if we're talking national championship category, Alabama has the most national championships. They get a one next to their name. So the goal is you want the lowest total points at the end when you tally it up. You want a one next to your name in each category. And the results were pretty stunning to me. Not for one team, but let's go through it. I'll just read to you. Let's just pick one school and go through the categories. So let's go USC. And these are their ranks, right? So wins, eighth. Winning percentage, eighth. Ten win seasons, six. National championships, fourth. Playoffs, tied 16th. All-Americans, fifth. Weeks in the top 25, sixth. Weeks at number one, fifth. Draft picks, second. First rounders, second. Heismans, first. For a total of 63 points. And USC finishes sixth. So that's kind of how we did it. Go through, rank them each in each category, and then add up the total at the end. Our number one school got 27 points. Out of 11 categories, they had only 27 points. That's amazing. Um, our weakest school of the eight historical Blue Bloods was 125th. Now, I also added in Georgia and Tennessee, who finished ninth and 10th into this. So if we're ranking the top 10, Georgia would be ninth, Tennessee would be 10th. And our top eight of the Blue Bloods, ranking the Blue Bloods in this way, goes number eight, Texas. Number seven, Nebraska. Number six, USC. Number five, Oklahoma. Number four, Notre Dame. Number three, Michigan. 
number two, Alabama, and number one with just 27 total points, the Ohio State University. And we'll go through their numbers. Wins, third. Winning percentage, first. Ten win seasons, fourth. National championships, fifth. Playoff appearances, third. Consensus All-Americans, second. Weeks in the top 25, first. Weeks at number one, second. Draft picks, third. First rounders, first. Heisman's tied second. Now, I went ahead and adjusted this because obviously you could have an outlier, right? You could have one where you're really good at, one category, one where you're really bad at. So what you just heard was the total. And I wanted to make sure that everything stayed the same if I threw out the best and the worst category, the best and the worst score for each school. So I did that and it came out in the exact same order. So we did it uh, standard. We did it adjusted. Same exact order. Number one program, Ohio State, edges out Bama, 27 to 31. After that, you got a gap. Then it goes down to Michigan and Notre Dame, who kind of ride together, 42 and 46. Then Oklahoma right behind them at 48. Then a big gap down to USC at 63. A bigger gap down to Nebraska at 98. And after Nebraska at 98, you go all the way down to 125 to get to Texas, which uh, my premise and the reason I started this was Texas, I believe, is way overrated uh, as far as the Blue Bloods and one of the weaker Blue Bloods that there is. And this confirms not only are they one of the weaker Blue Bloods that there is, they're the weakest Blue Blood that there is, even behind Nebraska by a considerable margin after 20 years of Nebraska being total garbage. Um, the second reason I started this was I thought Ohio State was undervalued by the general public and they did not get their proper due. And as we can see, they're number one. But no matter what you know, you can splice this any way you want. You can add in more categories, subtract, uh, subtract others, weight certain categories, and you're always going to come out with Ohio State and Alabama as number one and number two. So you can say Alabama is, is number one in your book because you want to weight national championships more. And you know what? Th that might be fair. Um, but, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't agree myself because I think national championships are the most overvalued stat, actually, in college football. That's my opinion. Uh, the, the thought that in 1950, um, some AP writer could accurately judge who the national champion is when he lives in Boston, Massachusetts, and does not watch any games on television or really read any newspaper articles, he looks at uh, maybe a box score, maybe just a score, and, and he votes off of that. It's just, it's, it's pretty absurd to think that that's the way we crown national championships. Um, it's even more absurd when we talk about claimed national championships. Um, you know, schools like Pitt that have nine national championships. Uh, Illinois has five national championships. Iowa has five. Uh, Michigan State has six. Uh, Cal has five. You know what I mean? Like national championships are just nonsense until you get to probably really the 80s, honestly, when people could actually watch the teams on TV and really compare them. Some people would kick it back down to, you know, the, the mid 60s. I think even that's too soon to to really say anybody had an accurate gauge on that. And uh, I think it's the most overrated stat there is. But if you wanted to wait that you could and you'd still come out with Ohio State and Alabama as number one and number two. But if you waited the national championships, Alabama would probably be number one. Either way, Ohio State, my guys, the ones I'm most concerned about. Um, are either the best or the second best program in the history of college football. And I didn't even factor in um, the, uh, the, the dominance that Ohio State's had, having never been bad. They've never dipped for a period of any substantial amount of time. The only program that's close in that category is Oklahoma. And uh, other, than, other than that, every one of these schools has had multiple periods where they've gone down, dipped down. Ohio State's never had one. Oklahoma's maybe had one. Um, so anyway, you splice it. Uh, the Buckeyes reign supreme or they reign number two. So that is how I rank the Blue Bloods. Tell me how you rank yours. And when I say the Blue Bloods, 
I basically mean that's how I ranked college football because it is it is the eight historical blue bloods who finished one through eight still after all these years. Um, what surprised me on the most the most on the list, I would say, is, is Nebraska still being seventh because for a while there, I was saying to people, you know, when do we get to the point where we kick Nebraska off this list? And it's clear that you can't kick Nebraska off this list yet because they're not even in last place. Um, Texas, Texas is uh, still not as successful as Nebraska. So Nebraska stays and, uh, and maybe Georgia is actually, Georgia is closer to Texas than Texas is to Nebraska by a considerable margin. If you look at this list here, you've got Georgia at 131, Texas at 125. Nebraska is at 98. So, you know, Georgia is on its way cooking with gas to catch in Texas in a lot of these categories. So anyway, that's my interesting, uh, interesting tidbit on that for the day. So thought you guys might enjoy. I did. I was really happy with the results. One other thing that surprised me was Michigan coming in third. Wasn't expecting that. I thought they finished fifth. Um, you know, just goes to show you how powerful that rivalry, rivalry really is. Michigan over Notre Dame, uh, Notre Dame fourth. So it's looking like those four, Ohio State, Michigan, Alabama, and Notre Dame are, are always going to be the top four, no matter what kind of numbers you use. And, uh, you know, pretty elite company, pretty rarefied air, and the Buckeyes are number one. So that'll be all. Thanks, guys. So there it is. Like I always thought, the Bucks are number one. Now, I don't know how any fair-minded person could look at that and uh, and see, like, listen, obviously, not everybody's looking at that data. Um, that data is all from Winsipedia, which compiles all of the all of the data, and it's very readily available to anybody. Uh, you can look at it. It's all it's all legit. If you break down those categories exactly the way I broke them down, um, the way I explained you will come up with the exact same figure. And that's just what it is, man. Now, if you want to take out or remove some of those categories, add in some others, you know, you very well could. Um, and and I, I promise you that you're going to come out with a very similar result because when you look at those categories and you break down Ohio State across the board, three, one, four, five, three, two, one, two, three, one, two. So take out whatever you want. Um, you know, you're looking at threes and twos and ones in every single category, but two. And in those two, they're number four and number five. I mean, Ohio State reigns supreme. And, you know, quite honestly, it wasn't close. When we look at the final scores, obviously you want the lowest score. Um, and uh, Ohio State, 27. Alabama, 31. So we're talking a four-point separation, and uh, even if you removed um, two of Ohio State's number ones, their lowest are still four and five. They are still, I mean, if you remove national championships, any way you splice this, this is going to come down to Ohio State and Alabama as number one and number two, any way you splice it. Uh, if you wanted to add some different criteria or take out some, any way you splice it, Alabama and Ohio State are going to be number one and two. And I believe no matter what way you try to choose it, uh, to, you try to maneuver it or fudge it, um, that's not going to change. Now, there could be a way, maybe if you wanted to say, okay, we're going to, I think that this category might mean more than, than the next. Maybe if national championships might mean more to you, um, then you would maybe weight that in a different way and say, I don't think national championships should should mean as much as let's say Heisman's. Okay, fair point. Maybe you want to do it that way. Um, I would disagree. I think national championships uh, before the playoff era are, uh, before the BCS, um, are, are extremely silly, to be honest, uh, particularly when you talk about uh, ones from before, uh, before integration. I mean, those ones are just worthless. And, you know, there's a whole lot of these uh, national championships that that Alabama claims that that are quite disputed, and by uh, ridiculous. There was a time 
when you would have four different national championships uh, in a uh, in a season. For instance, I wonder if you know that Iowa has five national championships or Michigan State has five national championships or Pitt. Pitt has nine national championships. Did you know that? That's how ridiculous national championships were years ago. So to say that you want to use them as the end-all, be-all to rate college football teams, or you want to use those to, you want those to weigh more, um, you know, go back and look at some of the the clubs that voted on national championships that teams claim as national championships. It's utterly absurd. It really is. And, uh, you know, that is the history of the sport of college football. And the reason why I, and this just kind of separate topic, I don't think college football was ever designed or ever should have been or ever should be all about one champion. And that's why I liked the bowl system. And I liked having five teams come away victorious, having won major bowls. Um, I thought it was a great system. Having the BCS as a one-off, I thought was a fine system. Um, I understand the playoffs going to be exciting. It's going to be great. But to compile all of these teams, just a tremendous amount of teams that played in different regions and say, we're just going to go after this one goal, just seems kind of wonky. And it was never the way it was intended to be. And that's why the national championships, much like when we talk about high school and high school teams having national champions that are that are voted on, it's just silly, right? You, you can't have a high school national champion. But we do. We have them, and they're voted on. And uh, that's just as silly as it was uh, that the uh, Rotary Club of uh, Nebraska voted on a national championship in 1930, and we still count that as one of the criteria here uh, as we rank the teams. So – that's what I think about that, and uh, the Buckeyes are number one. Biggest surprise to me on the list, I didn't expect Michigan to be number three. I expected them to be maybe five. Um, I was surprised at number three. Uh, another surprise, USC. I thought USC would probably be more where Michigan was, and uh, I thought Nebraska would would be under Texas. I did not expect Texas to be under Nebraska. I figured that the last 20 years of Nebraska's not so hot results would have uh, let Texas catch up to them. But unfortunately for the Horns, it did not. And eventually they will. And eventually Georgia will at some point because I don't ever see Nebraska coming back. But as of now, a lot of people want to kick up, kick Nebraska out of the blue bloods. Um, you can't kick Nebraska out of the Blue Bloods unless you kick Texas out first because Nebraska is still ahead of Texas. Anyway, guys, that's all I got. Let me know your feedback. This was my favorite episode I've ever done. I hope you enjoyed. Um, you can catch it on podcast form as you can all of the Juck on Bucks episodes. And I will talk to you guys in a couple of days because I'm going to do, uh, well, let's see. I'll do a big weekend episode next. That'll be the next episode. So we'll see you guys then. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.